welcome everybody. I'm very excited to, to have you all here this evening. This is our, our monthly green team evening, probably on one of the most important topics that we ever had here because it's such a, a, I mean, it's a crisis stage and it may get worse. We don't know. Um, my name is Peter Meissen. I'm the director here at the Sim Center. Several of you have not been here before. I think I see new faces and usually people go, what is this place, right? So uh, let me do that real quickly for you, for you that are uh, new. On the Sim Center, we have the website up here at number one. It's the World Resources Simulation Center. It's an idea originally thought through by a man named Buck Mr. Fuller. Bucky's most well known for what? What do you all know Bucky from? Geodesic dome, dome, right? Yeah. And if you're in the, the, the carbon field, this carbon molecule called the Buckminster Fullerene or Bucky Ball. So mm. one of the geniuses of our last I, century. I, I lived in a geodesic. Really? Oh, <laughs> my parents built one of those. together to grapple Christmas. with the hard issues of our day. And he'd actually proposed this for the Montreal Dome in 1967 at the International Fair at the U.S. Pavilion. Uh, never got done at that time, but we picked up that for you. Univision's here. Been here for four years now. And, and our mission here is to visualize sustainable solutions. Basically, that's the simple way of saying it. And visualize, obviously, you can see that. Visualize sustainable solutions to both global and local problems so we make smarter decisions quickly. And we've got to be making smarter decisions quickly. That's for sure. So that's our, our work that we do here. We do it all month long in, in many different ways. We have a dozen different projects. One of the projects here is the Green Scene, and Katie here manages the green team for us. And if you want to join and be a member and get here for free rather than pay 10 bucks, uh, talk to Katie. She can help you in doing that. You can do it online or with that little white form that's in front of you. Uh, the other thing that we do here and that I've been doing for my life is this initiative called the Genie Initiative. Uh, that's the website up here on number 12. It stands for the Global Energy Network Institute. This is Buckminster Fuller's number one strategy for the world. So that's no small statement when you understand Bucky. Uh, the question up there is this world game question. I'll say it in total. It's a long one. How do you make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological damage or disadvantage to anyone? I'll shorten that by saying, how do we provide a decent living standard for everybody in an environmentally sustainable way? The number one answer to that was clean energy for everybody. You and I have plenty of energy, right? Two-thirds of it's not clean in America and around the world. And there's still a billion and a half people that have no energy at all and need some to get out of poverty. The number one answer to that strategy is linking renewable resources around the world. Linking wind, linking solar, linking, renew uh, linking renewables so that whenever you flip a switch, switch, it's a clean electron versus a dirty one. We've been working on that a long time. I'm going to say the world is moving in that direction now at, a, at a, an accelerated pace, but not, not at scale and not deep enough in any country. But that's the work that we do all the time here. Um, that's kind of enough of a commercial about our two projects. I'm very excited to have both Toby and Luis here tonight. We have two of the top people here in San Diego that are working on this problem every single day in their work. Uh, so we all know that we're in a crisis. Uh, you can see it. Did you grab that? I did. Pointer? So <laughs> here's uh, somebody's uh, taken the California drop monitor, but there is a, a picture here that shows today's drought is just as bad as it, if it's ever as it's ever been because there's no snowpack. It's at five percent. Uh, we're already drawing water out of the Central Valley faster than it's being replaced for those farmers. We are in severe drought for the last four years, and nobody says it's going to get better unless we get more rain. Right. So that's that condition. Uh, up here we have the municipal water use by gallons, and you'll see some spikes there for, for Valley Center and Rancho Santa Fe. Those are big land owners, and they grow crops. So more than likely, they're going to use a lot more than you and me. I think on average in San Diego, you and I use about 60 gallons. Well, some of them are up at several hundred gallons per day. Uh, a lot of these times, the, our speakers might talk in acre feet. And I never knew what an acre feet was until I had to visualize it. So up on screen eight, you see an acre feet up there is about a football field, one, one foot deep. That's an acre foot. And that's enough to serve the needs of two families for about a year. So it's just a visual to help you understand that a little bit better. Uh, here's our two main sources of water in San Diego. Uh, they come from the Colorado River aqueduct and the Central Valley, or excuse me, the, the, the California aqueduct. That's about 80% of our import. So we live at the end of two long pipelines for the majority of our water. 
and both of them are extremely stressed right now. Uh, this was an interesting one that I saw on the paper that has to do with California water use. I'm going to ask our speakers about this. I learned about something called environmental water, uh, which is totally different than what they've been talking about before, which is half of our water supply goes to the fish. Right? So uh, we'll, I'm sure, address that. And then another one we put up here just for context is what it costs for the different sources of water, whether it's imported, underground, or the new desal plant that's coming online. It's going to provide about 8% of our water, but it's clearly the most expensive water that we have in the region. So that's just a, a backgrounder for you. Uh, what we like to do is to help have you help us with the presentation. Both of them have a slide deck for those that are sitting at PowerPoint. Uh, I think I showed you how to do it. If you click on Kobe's slide presentation, it's uh, on the bottom down there, and find the slide that corresponds with your number. So I'm sorry, your name again was? Brody. Brody, so Brody, you're going to find slide number nine and make it full screen. Uh, same thing, if you need any help, if you have any, uh, maybe Nina could help you there. If you need any help, one of our staff can run around and help you yeah. find that. We would like them to become full screen all the way around. So while you're doing that, Kobe is with the San Diego County Water Authority. She has been the regulatory manager there and is responsible for tracking, reviewing, and engaging on regu regulation and policy issues at local, state, and federal levels. She's got a Juris background, so she's both a lawyer and a water manager responsible for water conservation, integrated regional water management, and recycled water. This is the work that she lives in and swims in all day long. Um, and responsible for the water. County Water Authority was responsible for all the water that comes to us through those aqueducts. We're three million people in our county, and uh, that's her job. So I'm really okay. thrilled to have Toby here. Please welcome Toby Roy. <laughs> okay. I, I actually have to say one more thing in introducing myself in this uh, tribute to Buckminster Fuller. My parents built one of the first geodesic dome houses, which is the house I lived in um, growing up. So I've always, I'm a big fan of Buckminster Fuller. So um, I'm going to go on to the drought, this drought that we're in. And I, uh, how many folks have heard... 25% reduction in urban water use. <laughs> so it's all over the news. Um, I think the governor's proclamation has really done a great job of getting the word out there to the public on how serious this drought is and how everyone is going to have to do their part um, in responding to this drought. So a little bit about um, our water supply in um, San Diego County, which is on this graph and basically we have a mix of um, imported and local water supplies um, up until the mid 40s we were um, just dependent on our local water supplies and then they built um, the Colorado River aqueduct and the state water project that bring imported water um, into San Diego County and our growth in the county um, since the 40s has depended on those imported water supplies. It's actually a direct line of how much imported water and how many more people have come to the county. So I'm going to go the next slide right here is um, increasing our supplies and reliability through diversification. So back in 1991, we were um, primarily dependent on the Metropolitan Water District. So we're a wholesale water agency and we sell water to 24 member retail agencies in the San Diego region and uh, our wa a portion of our water comes from Metropolitan Water District which is a bigger wholesaler in Southern California and back in 1991 that was 95 percent of our water supply. We had a serious drought at that time and we were looking at 40% cutbacks. So we embarked on a program to diversify our water supplies. We have what's called a quantification settlement agreement that get, brings us conserved water um, from Imperial County, from the Colorado River. Um, we've had active conservation programs in this county since the early 90s. Um, we've supported local recycled water development. Um, most recently, we were constructing a seawater desalination plant. 
um, up in Carlsbad the, that will provide us about 10% of our supply. And then we support um, local groundwater and surface water. Um, some of the local supplies are really our member agency supplies, but we have supported them in um, encouraging them to develop those supplies. And we're continuing our diversification um, on into 2020. So if you, on the third slide, shows um, where we are um, this year as far as our snowpack. And it's actually looking almost worse than it was last year. So last year, we had a really low um, snowpack. And the allocation that we got from the state water project, which is coming down from Northern California down the California aqueduct, we had a 0% allocation last year. And this year, there's a 20% allocation of that supply. So our supplies from the Sacramento River Delta from uh, Northern California are severely impacted. And the third slide over here um, shows where we are um, since 2007. And everybody's saying this is a four-year drought, but it actually goes back to 2007 with one good year that we had that we replenished a lot of our storage um, in 2011. So we are definitely in a period of much lower um, precipitation, lower, uh, there, it's warmer, so there's less uh, snow. And so we, we are having uh, less water supply. Um, the other thing that's driving uh, some of the problems in California is um, looks like climate change because it's, it's a lot hotter um, than it has been in the past. So if you look at, at this slide on where we are in temperature as compared to other you know, average years at Lindbergh Field, um, you know, we've been hotter, um, quite significantly hotter for the last two years. And then if, you're, if you have outdoor irrigation, or even other water uses, the higher temperatures um, tend to drive the water use up at a time when we have um, less water supplies. So we, we are in a serious um, situation throughout California because of the weather that we have. Uh, we're a little better off in um, San Diego because we do have the um, conserved water from Imperial County, the desalination. We have a lot of uh, recycled water in the county. So that, that helps us um, get through it. But on, um, on this one here, on April 1st, uh, the governor uh, did a directive of 25% um, urban, potable urban water use during the time frame from June 2015 through February. And so they imposed some um, restrictions like irrigation of ornamental turf on public street medians, um, new construction has to have drip or micro spray. That's, that doesn't go to where you need to be to get your water use down. That's just a couple things that they threw in there. But it's really, what is really significant is over here is they have taken that 25% and they've assigned it down to all of the retail water agencies, which we, as I mentioned, we have 24 member agencies that have to meet um, urban water reduction targets. And the assumption that they made was if you use more water per person, then you are probably more wasteful. And so they didn't consider um, different climate factors. They didn't consider land uses, it was the assumption is all of that higher per capita use is just going to outside irrigation. And there's some truth to that, but it's not in all cases true. So in their um, first round, they included all of our water use. And in San Diego County, we have, um, and it was pointed out, I guess that slide's gone, but how Valley Center uses more water. Well, we have a number of agencies in the region that have pretty significant agricultural use, which have been hit very hard since 2007. Their, their use is actually down about 40% since 2007, and the groves are, a lot of the groves are dying. But there still is a strong agricultural community in San Diego County. So in this um, revisions that they came up with, um, the State Board recognized that. A lot of folks spoke up and said, this is a problem for us. And they, um, 
they uh, include it, they exclude the agricultural deliveries from this requirement um, to reduce 25%. Um, the other thing that we were concerned about in, is the fact that if you have a local, it's, it's not a supply-based requirement, it's a bit demand-based. It's to get the demands down. And we recognize that um, statewide we all have to do our part and um, we do have to reduce demands, but we also have adequate supply. We don't want to have an impact on our economy or our business community in San Diego. So we've been, um, we've been providing those comments to the state board. But this chart here shows on the current draft, it's not final, but the draft uh, uh, regulations that they're proposing have ranges for each of our different um, member agencies and those are ranging um, from 12% up to 36%. So how much the agencies are going to have to save is going to be um, pretty variable um, throughout the San Diego region. And so um, what we'll be reporting is our total use and uh, it'll be compared to the use in 2013 and so it doesn't really account for the long history of conservation that we have. or in, um, So we're just compared against 2013. And then they're measuring it monthly um, and, and have a cumulative compliance. So some of the concerns that we have raised um, that we would like to see addressed in this is taking into account investments on our new, our drought proof supplies. So we don't really want to cut into um, critical uh, uses in the region to meet this goal. Um, and then the, the rate payer should receive the benefit of the investment that we've made locally. And uh, it, we did invest consistent with the water action plan that asked us to increase our local regional self-reliance. So we really want to see the focus on these discretionary outdoor water uses and not water uses that are critical to our economy. So that's the end of my first um, set. And then that next slide goes in the next set. So the, looking at slides 1 through 11, now's the time. We'd love to have you engage in questions, uh, dialogue uh, with Toby specifically about what you just heard. Okay. Uh, okay. Regarding your third slide, the projected increase in supply from 2014 to 2020, given what I'm reading in the papers, you know, that there is no more water available other than the desal plant. Where is the, where is the new supply well, coming from? That's from, that is from our urban water management plan. And so um, we were looking at the supplies, um, some of those supplies are coming, are coming from uh, the Imperial Irrigation tra Transfer, uh, the canal lining, additional, con we expected that we will continue to do additional conservation into the um, future. So we did this plan, um, this is what we were guessing back in 2010. So it's based on where we think we would be going into 2020 when we, when we were back in 2010 and looking at that. So obviously, our situation in the region is, in the state, and the region is changing, and we're working on our 2015 urban water management plan right now. So the supply mix into the future is going to look a little different. We have um, a lot of our member agencies are interested in doing potable reuse. So you're going to see, and, and how many folks have heard of the city of San Diego's pure water program? So a few. Well, can so you get to that? So because you're gonna, he's going to talk about that. So I won't talk about that. But that's, and, and we have a lot of other member agencies who are looking at um, potable reuse. And Luis will talk about that more in his presentation. California, this is the, this is the agency that is our wholesale buyer, right? Yeah. Right. You're back. Yeah. And then you know, we need to have you use the microphone so that they can hear it on the tape. On your tape. So when you're asking a question, please use I noticed in your allocation of cutbacks, you've got uh, a district such as uh, Valley Center, which is very much into agriculture. And uh, how did you come up with those percentages? Okay, we didn't. 
that's not our numbers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, is the, this is the numbers that are imposed by the state board based on trying to get people to use less water throughout California. So these are the numbers coming from the state as a mandate. And so what, what we did um, was uh, there was a lot of comments sent to the state. So this isn't final yet, but Valley Center and some of these other um, ag agencies like uh, Rainbow or Fallbrook, so we have a number of ag agencies up there, will be able to take um, their commercial agricultural d deliveries out and it could change, it could change their number and then their number is just going to be based on their residential use. So. Looks like all the 36 percent up there are the are the agricultural districts. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Brook, for, Valley Center. for the most part, they uh -huh. are. Yeah. Yeah, and okay. some of them will meet the ag exception, and some of them won't. Got it. Please. It, it looks like they're going to invest in lining the aqueduct, but why don't they cover it altogether? Um, I think that, I don't know if that's something that's ever come out as being cost effective. So there was a lot of water being lost by um, seepage. So, but nobody has come up with that that's a cost effective approach to cover. With the current temperatures and evaporation, I was just in Death Valley and it was 100 degrees every day. It is hot out there. And I don't know the I numbers. Don't know. I don't know the cost effectiveness numbers on that. Anybody ever studied covering an aqueduct and the cost of that? I know my pool evaporates a lot, <laughs> right? Yeah. And yep. I put a blanket on it to, to minimize mm -hmm. that. So um, somebody's got to have studied that, right? I would think so. I just yeah. don't have those numbers. Question? Um, so my question is, um, has there ever been any talk about a, another way to capture water in northern, um, the northern United States, western, you know, uh, Oregon, Washington, and just bring it down to California, southern California, like, kind of like the Alaskan pipeline <laughs> is, okay. is done really, like, uh, uh, to I'll, just bring I'll, it on down. There's I'll so give, much rain. first time I'll give you my Oregonian comment on that, because I, I am from, I'm actually originally from, I grew up in the geo, geodesic dome up in the Pacific Northwest, <laughs> so, um, so I, I think that you're, it's going to be a hard sell with the folks in Oregon and Washington like to say, we're going to send all our water down to California. And they're probably going to say, California, you need to figure out how to live within your means. And, and maybe, you know, what can you do in California to address uh, your water supply issues? So I, I personally, I think that's going to be a good, it's, it's their water, so that'll be a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> I had my wife saying, there's so much rain in the East Coast right now, can't we just ship it here? And I said, it sounds like a big pipe and a lot yeah. of energy. Yeah. Right? I think they would send us a lot of snow if they could <laughs> over on the East Coast. Norm? Uh, has there been any consideration of using uh, wastewater or uh, stormwater collection as a separate source of water uh, to be placed in the system? I mean, we're throwing away a hundred so, um, so we do in the in the San Diego region. We recycle right now. Um, we recycle about thirty thousand acre feet a year of yeah, wastewater. The, the ability to recycle one hundred and fifty million. So I'm going to let Luis answer that, since it's, okay. since everybody wants to know about the, what the city's the pure water. Pure water. So yeah, I'll let we'll Luis. Well, Luis is going to talk oh, about I, that. I, I can I can quickly answer the question. Pure water uh, in San Diego, we did a demonstration project to see if there's technology and the cost effectiveness of doing this. Um, and so that study passed and we'd like to now do it full scale. So what happens there is that the water that's recycled, so effluent coming in, so uh, uh, wastewater, it's recycled uh, into what we would call purple pipe water, recycled water. But, and usually what that happens is that is uh, now distributed through a purple pipeline for irrigation and maybe cooling tower use currently. Problem there is that it's, you got seasonal usage. You got peak usage in the summer and then during the winter months, most of that water that's treated actually goes back to the ocean. 
So we'd like to come up with something that has a more consistent demand. And what better way to do it is try and see if you can treat it to a level that afterwards you can pump it back to a reservoir. That's what pure water is. Um, so in terms of your question on wastewater, we have studied it and we're looking at actually capturing and reusing most of it. The pure water program, uh, unfortunately in the state, uh, there are no current regulations on potable reuse yet. Well, well back, actually there is. Uh, the standard of design is, is to provide tertiary water. And there are all kinds of systems that will give you tertiary water. Correct. For, for tertiary, correct. But then to put it into the potable water supply, that hasn't been, uh, so either indirectly to a lake or directly to a treated pipeline, treated water pipeline. So we're, one of the things that we're asking the state, as they ask us to conserve water, and they're t telling us to do 25% reduction, we're asking them to please expedite the process of coming up with these regulations as it relates to potable water so we can use pure water sooner as a source of alternative for us. But, but on the other side of the coin, you're using drinking water to irrigate, you're using drinking water to wash your cars, uh, and you're, you're, you're designing water to a standard that uh, for potable water when potable water is not required. And, and so far as potable water is concerned, there is a sufficient uh, humidity and, and in the air that you can actually go down to the store and buy a unit that will provide a household two to five gallons a day of potable water. Right. Uh, water. Yeah, so on the on the tertiary, we do do quite a bit of tertiary water in the in the county. So like I said, we do about 30,000 um, acre feet a year. And what it happens is as the um, in in the region, they hit the biggest users first. So your parks and your golf courses, um, we have cooling towers. So they the it's most a co cost effective when you have the largest users. As you get to smaller and smaller users, it becomes less uh, cost effective because you have to make sure that you have a separate piping system and that the pipes of the tertiary water don't get cross-connected with your potable water. So it ends up, um, you know, from a regulatory perspective, it's a lot more challenging as you get smaller and smaller uses. And I do think um, we're going to see um, with the water supply situation that people are going to be using less water outside in the future, just probably way into the future. All right, good. I'm going to let her do her next step. And uh, so if you are at screens numbers one through six, the rest of you can stay where you are. So if you're at one through six, so that includes you down here on six, and okay. five, count down 12, click down to 12. So number 13 here, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. This will be number 18. That'll be the last step for us. Okay. So you're going to start over here on number 12. I'm, I'm right here. Well, she's going to continue okay. her next sort of her solution side of this. Okay. So, um, back, we have a, actually a, a plan for orderly response to drought in the San Diego region. We put the plan in place back in 2006, and then we, we got to pull it right off the shelf in 2007 when we had the last uh, drought. And so what it does is it's a supply-based plan. As our supplies are reduced, then um, we take action to allocate the water out to our member agencies because we're going to have less water um, to give to them. And then it also includes an ordinance where we ramp up the requirements on the customers as the drought gets worse. So initially it's like, okay, everybody, please conserve, you know, and it's a more of a voluntary. And as you ramp up through the different uh, drought levels, the requirements become mandatory and then they become more um, stringent. And so that's based on how much supply that we have. So this year, um, we, activated, uh, we activated the plan in um, uh, 20, uh, February 2014. And then we're at, right now we're at this level here of a drought alert. 
and then we notified the water agencies of mandatory conservation, and then we've done enhanced um, outreach, and we have conservation programs to encourage people to save water. And then this, is, this here is just kind of a bigger picture uh, timeline. The way our allocations work is um, Metropolitan will um, determine if they're going to have a supply cutback, which this year they said their cutback is 15%. So we figure out how much water is coming um, from Metropolitan, and we add in our own supplies locally, and then we figure out um, how much water that we have for everyone. And as you can see, the supply cutback here is a lot less than the state's demand management requirements. So we actually have more, um, we have more supply than, than what we're going to be using under the state's mandatory um, conservation requirements. And so we're in the process right now of the state board uh, making all these rules, which will be finaled in the beginning of May, on May 5th and 6th. And then our uh, Water Authority board will have a special board meeting on May 14th, and that will determine, will determine um, what our cutbacks are to our member agencies and where we are on this drought level. So we'll, we may go to a different level of drought response, but we will allocate water to our member agencies based on the supply that we have available for them, which will, be, which will probably be a little bit higher than what they're going to be using. They're going to be using less water than their allocation. And then um, the state board regulations, they were saying June 1st, and now they're saying, we, we think we can get them in place by May 15th. So <laughs> they're pretty excited about this. So, uh, and, uh, and then on July 1st is when the MWD allocation. And so, um, so these, these two um, activities are really influencing our response actions because the agencies are definitely, uh, they're gearing up because this, this reduction goes into place, you know, May 15th, or they may start counting it on June 1st. So they actually have to get out there to get all of their customers to reduce by that amount starting in June 1st. So there's, not, there's no ramp up period on this. The customers need to immediately um, start reducing their water use. So there'll be a um, pretty significant outreach on that. And, uh, and then um, here's some other, we have a long time active conservation programs in the San Diego region to help uh, folks. And, and Luis will talk about what the city does. But we do have a, a website that gives people ideas on what they can do, where you can get access to programs. I did put some flyers out for folks if you're interested in that. Um, we, we have this water smart checkup with some of our member agencies um, so they can come and help people um, figure out how to conserve and, and where they're wasting water. And then we have um, inf information out there that if I, I actually, I'm a friend of the water, I'm a friend of the Water Authority <laughs> on Facebook. But, so we have, some, we have really good Facebook posts. If you want to see what's going on, I mean, we have something. It used to be we're going, well, we'll try to get something up every day. Now you can get something up three times a day. So, so if you want to track what's going on, we have it there on Facebook. And I think that, that's a repeat. So, yeah. So my, my question on this was you're forcing people to cut back. And if they don't, then what? Or what's the consequence? Okay, so uh, so there's two there's two there's two things. One is the allocation, so they have to stay within their means of the our water supply. But the big driver, this um, governor's mandate, the governor uh, in the state board and their regulations, they have an enforcement capability of five hundred dollars a day, and they can issue orders to the water agencies. And they're telling the water agencies, you have to make your customers save water. So the, all the mandate is on the water agencies. And then the water agencies have these um, ordinances that are based on the drought ordinance. So they will go to most likely use um, their water use restrictions 
in the ordinances that they have to enforce requirements on their users. So there's ability to find people, give them notices, and uh, you know the the hope is that people really will step up um, to save this water. But Peter, um, in terms of answering that question, the state board is going to look at how you're doing when you start reporting monthly. And if it looks like you're not going to meet your targets, that's when they step, step in with secondary orders. They can tell you, hey, you got to look at pricing. You, you, you don't have the, uh, enough tiers. They can ask you to look at that. They can tell you, hey, you want to go to two days a week watering. They can make us do that as part of the secondary orders. But it, does, it doesn't happen right away. They allow us the opportunity to try and meet our goals. Yeah. The other thing on our May um, 14th, I, I think our board's going to have a big discussion on, you know, should we all be kind of consistent across the region in our messaging about what people need to do, or is it going to vary from agency to agency? So a lot of it's um, informing the public of what's expected of them, too, is, is really important to, to get people moving in the same direction. The fines would be to the water authorities, but what, what about us in the room as homeowners or users, oh, that if, what if we don't cut back and we, what happens to us? So my role in this as the city representative is translate all of this to the customer. What does that mean to you? So I'll cover that. Okay, all right. So other questions to Toby? I'm wondering how that's affected by you know, this recent court decision that says you can't charge more for the water, it's the delivery yes. that the, yeah. the charge is based on. Yes. Is that one of the things you consider is enforcement is the, is the rate and how does it, it, it it's definitely something that we have to abide by it's prop 218 and it requires water agencies to only charge based on the cost of providing a service so um, maybe i should answer the question if we were to uh, now come up with penalties or fees for not meeting your allocation it has to go through the 218 process it has to go through a public workshop and public hearing so because it is part of, we would say, the cost of providing the service. And if we are fined for exceeding our allocation, we have to pass that on to the consumers and likely the consumers who did not meet their allocations. So I, I'll make a comment on the, the um, court case. So uh, most of our member agencies um, in San Diego County, in fact, I'd say all of them, do have these tiered rates. So we have rates that encourage um, water conservation in the county, and I, and I think one of our agencies might be next in line to get sued. So the state board is, is, um, has been pushing this rate issue, and I don't know if you've seen the, the governor wants to be able to push it, but we're really up against, as a, you know, a community, water, the water community has to figure out um, what approaches are uh, acceptable and legal for rates? Because we have a, whole, a lot of different rate structures out there. One more piece of that. So um, it's unconstitutional because there's a law that says that you can't do that. Is it? Uh, it why can't they just change the law? Well, the it's in. So you have you have the California. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. So there's a California Constitution that says that. Um, you have to have a di direct relationship to what someone's receiving for what you charge them for that. So there are ways to do um, tiered rates um, if you provide the proper justification in when you set your rates. And so um, th there's ways to do it, but not everyone is followed, <clears throat> you know, within the within the bounds of the Constitution and the Constitution of California is pretty hard to change. So you're going to be up against the Taxpayers Association and all that to be able to change that. And this was the case with San Luis Obispo getting, uh, or San Luis Capistrano. San Juan, San Juan Capistrano. Capistrano. Yes, the, the, the judge said unconstitutional rate structure. Right. Right, OK. Others, Alan? Yeah, talk about uh, difficult to change. Uh, Forbes magazine had an article about why is California wasting billions of gallons of storm water? Uh, every year, and I've, I've been told that uh, part of the problem is that stormwater has been, it, it, they, they send it, they turn it into sewage water as soon as possible. It goes down the sewer and it's treated like sewage instead of like 
you know, uh, a, a blessing from heaven, which is what it is. Why, what can we do to harvest more of our stormwater besides putting in cisterns like they did in Australia and became one of the most energy, water efficient countries around? Okay, so in, this, in the San Diego region, most of, actually most of our rainwater falls in the mountains um, on the east side of San, you know, east of San Diego. And we actually, the city of San Diego has a number of reservoirs. Our other member agencies have reservoirs. So where the bulk of the rain is falling, we are capturing that water locally and using it. Um, there's this big push to get it into the groundwater because that's a good place to store it. But in the San Diego region, we have pretty limited uh, groundwater basins. So, you know, there's, uh, we, it, there's not a whole lot for that we can do to capture the remaining water that's going out to the ocean. Besides uh, rain barrels? You can have, yeah, I, at my house, I, have, I capture all the rain off my uh, roof and use it um, to, to water my vegetable garden. So people can do that. And, and you actually can get, I, I can fill up probably, you know, five, 500 to 750 gallons in a rainstorm. So you can capture quite a bit off your roof. How many have a cistern at your house? An empty hot tub. And they give you a seventy-five dollars credit for that cistern now, up to four or five cisterns if I remember. But four. if you're in the city of San Diego, it's a dollar per gallon, up to four hundred dollars for rain barrels. Well, I so. think I just have one. I need to yeah. get more. Yeah. <laughs> I recommend at least two hundred and fifty gallons. Because you can get quite a bit, oh, you can get quite a bit in one storm. Questions to Toby here? Yes. Um, I'm wondering when the okay, how you, if there's fines like there were or penalties back in the '90s, was it? Well, uh, anyway, the point is, if someone's already reduced and you're going to judge from May, you know they have to go from May to June, reduce 25 percent. What if they've already let their lawn die and there really isn't any more reduction and their family size has increased? Yeah. So we'd be wasting our time to go after those people, right? Yeah. <laughs> that would be a waste of time. So the focus is going to be on the big users or the people who are wasting water. Why would nobody's going to go if after they people? They don't who are, go down 25%. They're not going to be penalized on their bill. It's not a by customer basis. Yeah. I think uh, what you're doing is fine. My concern is what happens in two or three years. Continuation of the drought. Yes, the uh, desal plant will be online, and that's going to pick up 10% of our current use, and maybe 12 or 13% of what our future use would be. But I, I saw a, a program that indicated we had a year or two of surface water, and three to five years of groundwater, and after that, there's nothing. That's the long-term plan. Okay, so I'm not gonna, the state of California is in, uh, in trouble with water, <laughs> for sure. I, and I think uh, locally, like the city, the city's project, the Pure Water Project, and our other member agencies, some of them are looking at, and, and I don't know if Luis, I don't know what the city's plan is, but some of our member agencies are going, how fast can we build this if we need to? So we have a lot of projects that were planned for, you know, 2020, 21, 23, who are, and the agencies are going, how fast can I do this? Yeah. So people are thinking about it. And I'll also address that question partly in my presentation. Would you give Toby a hand? Yeah. Yeah. Talk about a job in the hot seat right now, huh? Uh, you know, this is a, we're counting on them to make sure the water keeps running out of our faucet at some reasonable price. So thank you for that. Luis, uh, so before we, uh, if you are on a laptop, if you could hit escape, and that will take you out of this presentation. At the bottom it says Luis Guerrero, and open that slide deck. We just lost number three. Can somebody help? Paul Michael, could you help over on number three? 
<laughs> the wrong, you hit the other escape, right? So we want to have, if your slide is number one, go to number one. So you hit escape over here. Let's see. Did you hit escape? Some of mine are so now go down to Luis Guerrero down here. How are we doing? Number three? Are you doing okay over there? Did you hit it? I see four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Pretty close there, Luis, on most of them. We'll get them all up. Don't mind up getting number three. Very good. So, uh, Luis Guerrero, he's the Water Resources Manager for the City of San Diego Public Utilities Department and head of the San Diego Water Conservation Program. He's been doing this work since 1991. So water is in his veins, in his bones. This guy knows the City of San Diego's water issues intimately. It's, what his focus is on is on reducing demand. So if there's a supply side, that's about increasing increasing maybe through pure water and desal. His focus is on reducing demand over here and making decisions for better water use. When we had his bio up here, there's at least 10 or 12 different member agencies, water departments that he's involved in locally and around the state. And it's just, a, it's, it's thrilling to have Luis here to tell the story about our city specifically and what the city of San Diego can do as one member agency. How many agencies at, 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 within? 24. 25? 24. So 24 agencies in the County Water Authority, the city of San Diego is just one of those, but it's the biggest, right? So Luis, thank you. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I'll get off the hot seat. Okay. <laughs> I don't like being in the hot seat, so I'm going to stand. Um, and thank you for inviting me. My name is Luis Generoso, and it, it's okay. <laughs> and um, true enough, I've been with water conservation since 1991. What I wanted to do is I wanted to show you how all of this talk with the governor and the reductions will impact customers in the city of San Diego. And so let's start with slide two over here to your, uh, this side of the room. Um, so the governor declared, declared a drought back in January 2014. And since then, there were three executive orders trying to define what the restrictions would be. And then Toby mentioned April 1st was a key date for us because that's when he issued the mandatory order for 25% reduction. In the city of San Diego, what has been happening? Well. You remember the drop back in 2009, 2011? I don't know if you were here in San Diego. We had mandatory restrictions back then. And then it was Governor Schwarzenegger who was our governor then when he called for that, uh, for conservation. In 2011, where we were getting out of a drought. And we said, well, wait a minute. Some of the restrictions that we put in place made sense to just keep them. It doesn't make sense to tell people, it's okay to wash down your sidewalks. It's okay for water to run off your property. It didn't make sense for us to lift those restrictions, so we created permanent restrictions. And we've had permanent restrictions in place since 2011, which really were the restrictions from 2009. So if you think about it, we've had restrictions since 2009. However, in response to the governor's call, in July of last year, we went into voluntary restrictions. So on top of the permanent restrictions, we instituted voluntary restrictions, and those changed in November to uh, mandatory restrictions. So what were those permanent restrictions that I was talking about? So irrigation, not allowing irrigation to run off your property. No excessive irrigation. Made sense. That's a permanent restriction. Fixing or stopping leaks. It doesn't make sense for you not to do anything about it. So it became a permanent restriction. Watering in the middle of the day is a no-no. Most of it goes out in evaporation anyway. So we made that a permanent restriction. You can only water before 10 or after 4 during November to May, or after six, June to October. Uh, hosing down driveways and paved areas, except of course for um, health and safety reasons. Uh, you'd have to do that. You'd sometimes see down here downtown, they're power washing, and it's really for health and safety reasons. And uh, serving water in restaurants only upon request is the permanent restriction, as is hotel and motel customers uh, requesting that their linen not be washed on a daily basis. Level two, when we went to level two in November, we added watering only during your three assigned watering days a week. 
you know, that's, that's the big one for level two. You were assigned a watering, the watering days based on the number of your house or your property. So if you are in an odd numbered property, an odd numbered residence, it's Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. And the reason I remember that is Sunday's the first day of the week. So odd number, first day, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. And then for even numbered properties, it's Saturday, Monday, Wednesday. We try to give residents at least one week and day to, so that they can inspect their, their irrigation system. They're at home, that they can inspect them. And then for commercial customers and apartments, it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They usually have landscape staff who can work during those times. So that's the logic behind that. And that if you have uh, the standard uh, pop-up fan type sprinklers, no more than seven minutes. If you have the, the water efficient ones, whether drip, micro spray, or the ones that rotate, those are not, uh, those are not limited to seven minutes because those, those are already water efficient. You're trying to uh, distribute it better so that there's no runoff, there's no waste. Uh, stopping the use of ornamental fountains uh, is currently in place, unless for maintenance. Sometimes they have to run it for the pump, sometimes to circulate chlorine, for whatever reason, but they can only run it for maintenance purposes. Washing vehicles, follows the same uh, time schedule as uh, irrigation. And this is a big one. Uh, we had this in our level two uh, ever since, no irrigation during rain. Made sense. When it's raining, turn it off. But the, but, but the governor added this, and within 40 hours. In his, in his uh, uh, with the state board, when they made that requirement, they said within 48 hours uh, after measurable rain. Problem is, what is measurable rain? Uh, that's always subjective. So we just say within 48 hours, um, and we, whenever we expect measurable rain, we announce that through our uh, media, whether it's social media or regular media. We announce that to turn it off, reminder to turn it off. And I'll show you later, actually, I can show you this right now. December shows a big drop in consumption. Why? Because it rained. If you remember, there were a couple of storms in December. We asked the customers to turn off your irrigation systems uh, because, again, you don't need to run your sprinklers, and it showed right here. Um, with regards to reporting to the state board, every month water agencies are required to report their total uh, demand, so water production, total water production, and their residential gallons per capita per day, so how much water each residential customer uses a day. That's something that we report on a regular basis and they compare it to the year 2013. Um, this chart here shows this zero line is what 2013 is. So when we compare current to 2013, when you're at zero, that means you're at the same level. Um, you can see a little bit of fluctuation. We were close to within 5% either way. But if you remember last year, and you, you probably saw uh, Toby's chart, the, the one that has the red bars, it was a record hot year. In fact, record hot 17 years, uh, 17 months in San Diego. So with the record heat, you usually would assume uh, more irrigation. Actually, we did pretty good. We didn't go gangbusters in, compared to 2013. But in the, when the state board reviews it, it still shows that when the governor called for a tw uh, 20 or 25 percent reduction, San Diego's water did not go down, it went up. So, this slide, this slide here is also important. Uh, what's that? I'm sorry, I didn't get it. We called for a reduction and we went up in you. I know. It was hard to try and explain that because we would say uh, the rainfall was, uh, you know, lower. It's like two, two inches lower than in 2013. There was more, you know, or we would say that the, the, the average temperature was seven degrees hotter than it was in a comparable year. So there's a reason why, why um, it went up. But overall, if you look at it overall, we're actually down by 2% so far. And December helped a lot. But here, this is more long term. Now remember, 2009 is when we did uh, the mandatory restrictions from the last route. And you can see it went down and down significantly. This point compared to 2007, 
I use 2007 because that's the last non-drought year. Non, last year, we didn't have drought messaging. 2008, we started with a 20-gallon challenge. I don't know if you remember, you remember the 20-gallon challenge? A little bit, yeah. So we had messaging there, and in 2009, we started messaging on the drought. So 2007 was the last non-drought year. And so we hit about 17% off of 2007. Pretty good. And I'd say that even if we, re if we lifted the restrictions, you know, there was a slight bump, but it didn't go all the way back up to pre-drought levels, consumption. And then uh, right now, if we're close to 2013 in terms of consumption, 2015 fiscal year 2015 would be about where 2013 is. So it's showing a, showing a decrease compared to 2014, but in the eyes of the state, they want to compare it to 2013, so we're about even. Do you want, can I take the questions out, or you want? Did you want to finish through 10? Okay, well, let me just finish, okay. Two through 10, okay. So, residential gallons per gallon. San Diego's resident, this residential gallons per capita, again, just residential use, does not count commercial uses in San Diego, just the amount of water that uh, went to residential homes divided by population. That's your residential gallons per capita day. Now, uh, San Diego in September, we were at 82 gallons per person per day compared to September for some of the other cities in, in the state. To put that in perspective, the state uh, considers indoor consumption, uh, efficient indoor consumption at 55 gallons per person per day. To, for the state, that's, that's efficient, okay? Remember the, you know, people saying, uh, Outdoor landscape, outdoor irrigation uses about uh, half of total water use. Well, not in San Diego. If, if it's 55, then, then our, if, it, if that's true, that we would be at 110. But no, we're not. We're at 82 in a, in a warm month, in a warm summer month. And then in February, we were at 46 gallons per person per day. So San Diegans are, are doing really well, you know? Of course, there's this lady from San Francisco. They're doing 45 gallons of person per day. That's really, that's really impressive. Yeah, but, but San Diego's not that far behind. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, he said that, not me. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and then the last one for the first set. Uh, so the 25% mandatory reduction that the governor called for um, has changed. So it was originally 25%, but then they said they want to consider residential gallons per capita per day. If you have a higher residential gallons per capita per day number, then it's easier for you and you should uh, reduce more. Compared to if you have a low residential gallons per capita per day, it's harder for you to achieve, achieve the same 25%. So the 25% became a sliding scale. And the first iteration of that was that San Diego was at 20%. Instead of 25, it was 20. With uh, back and forth comments to the state board, the, the next iteration, as uh, you saw in the slide that Toby presented, San Diego's at 16%. They're recognizing past conservation um, in San Diego and putting that into the equation. But as uh, Toby said, what they haven't recognized is the improvements, the, the, uh, what the, the, um, the commitment that we've had to improving our, our, low, our water supply and our infrastructure. You know, we started paying for these improvements water bills um, in terms of uh, diesel coming online that we started paying for that but what's happening with the state is that they're not recognizing that they're treating San Diego the same way as uh, other customers in other parts of the state that did not make uh, improvements to their water supply so we're pointing that out to them and hoping that they would give us some credit and so that's why I said 16 it may change the comments were due today and they'll come up with their final version of what they would vote on in early May. That they would come up with that on the 28th. So can it, will it say it's 16%? Maybe. Would it uh, go lower? Maybe. Would it go higher? I'd, I hope not. Okay, because it's harder. If you can see here, it's hard enough to try and get 8%, or sorry, 25% here because of rain, but we were at 4.4, 4, 4, 4, 4, minus 4.4. 4. If we continue to be uh, assessed against 2013, yeah, we need to do a better job. We need to ask San Diego to conserve more, pretty much. Um, 
Toby covered most of this, so I'm down. I'm finished with slide 10. Can I take the, somebody had a question. So questions now about mostly these first 10 slides. He's going to go into city's response in his last set. Uh, um, let it do it, because we hadn't been over here yet. Why don't you come up here? Shelby, one of our volunteers. Um, so for that 25% reduction, I'm assuming that didn't include agriculture? Or was it just residential that was included in that reduction? Yeah, uh, San Diego, City of San Diego doesn't really have a whole lot of agricultural customers. Uh, it's more of the North, North and East County uh, agencies that have it. Okay, and then I just had another question about um, improving efficiencies outside of the residential consumer. Um, is there anything like that? in place yes programs yes so commercial customers uh, multifamily customers um, we have programs in place whether it's a, 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 a survey of the facility we can go into a facility and look at ways that they use water find opportunities to conserve and then we uh, we uh, use metropolitan water districts rebate program they have a very robust incentive program for commercial customers where it be uh, uh, cooling towers, cooling tower con uh, conductivity controllers, anything to do with efficiencies in the kitchen and process water, they have, they have uh, incentives for that. So those are available to San Diego commercial customers. I see the same hands going up. So if you want to ask a question, you got to get your hand up. In the uh -huh. okay. What is your, or how are you going to enforce this? All these, Ooh. all these. That's coming up in, uh, in another slide. Okay. Enforcement's coming, okay. Uh, Sai in the back here. Uh, no, all this is fine, but uh, I wanted to ask, uh, do you have any plan to reduce the water use for fracking? Because fracking consumes a hell of a lot of water, so I'm, and there are a lot of fracking sites here in California. Yes. So, uh, c considering we are in drought, uh, I think we should stop uh, using water for fracking. Yeah, I, I, the city of San Diego, but go ahead and you want to give it a call? Or? Yeah, yeah, city of San Diego does not, uh, fracking doesn't happen, I think, in city of San Diego, but we definitely would like to conserve. This is a global problem. It's not just, you know, one area's problem. So um, a global solution to that, and that, I think that, that is one of those that needs to be looked at seriously. Is that, is that part of your committee discussion, dis discussions that you've been having with all of these, these uh, inputs into the state? Uh, see, I, I Does don't that think, come up? It, no, well, other agencies point that out, not necessarily us, because I don't think it happens here. Okay. All right. Uh, Dan. I know that you have a limited number of agricultural assets here in, in the city, but one is which you own as the city owns the San Pasquale Agricultural District. And I believe that uh, an enlightened management of that asset, include, and it also has an aquifer, Correct. could kind of set a standard that could be used by others as an example. Exactly. I mean, we're not, we're not, uh, Everybody's in it. Everybody will have a, uh, a share because the, the goal that we will be assessed with in terms of reduction goal is a citywide goal. So everybody would need to do their part. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, hi. Is there a plan to reduce the amount of building permits and reduce the amount of people that are allowed to come into the city of San Diego? It's good questions. Always a question that's asked. Now, um, Toby talked about the, uh, the ordinances that each of the agencies have, and they come up in different stages, okay? So we are currently in level two, and level two calls for up to 20% reduction. There are certain uh, targets, so level two where we are, it's calling for up to a 20% reduction. The level three, the next step, deals with permits. So it is coming. If we need to conserve more than the 20%, it would have to be triggered. But, uh, so it is in our code, it, it, it is there, it is not ignored, but we didn't have to trigger that yet. So if we go to a level three crisis level, then that actually will affect building permits? It's in the municipal code, yes. There you go. So we're not quite there yet, and, but. And, and it's not just in the cities, so other water agencies have similar ordinances in place. So um, that would be addressed throughout the county. And didn't I see level four 
means you just stop watering lawns altogether, something to that effect, if we get to that level? Yeah, ornamental lawns uh, versus uh, functional lawns or func like, you know, recreational areas, yeah. So what's the difference between organ, ornamental, and functional? Okay, if the only time you step on your lawn is when you mow it, you don't need a lawn. That's ornamental lawn. Okay. okay. If kids play on it, they play soccer, they play football, that's functional recreational lawn. And we, we continue to need that. Great to know those definitions, isn't it? Norm. Uh, looking at the chart, the water use from 2007 to 2014, are those figures at the top the amount of water coming into the system? This is a, the amount of water that we use through the city of San Diego. So that's just for the city? Correct. Uh, so how can you, how, what additional information would you need to try to figure out how much of the water is actually retained within the watershed as opposed to what's being lost to the watershed which is the water being discharged out at Point Loma. Right. I'm trying to get apples to apples. Uh, and it, it, I had understood that rough calculation was that San Diego Water Authority would import 300 MGD a day. Uh, and going out is 150 million mm -hmm. uh, gallons per day in the wastewater. Mm -hmm. What happens to the difference? Where is it? Is it still in the system? It hasn't been used yet? It could have been that it was used as recycled water. So it went back to the system as a non-potable mm -hmm. non water. Yeah. Plus it's also um, your, di your difference between um, what, what, like what we bring into the county versus what goes out as sewage is going to be your consumptive use. It's your consumptive use. You're going to be using it on watering lawns, cooling towers. It's just it's going to be used to the point where it doesn't well, go it, back it, to the sewer. It, it, it's going to be still within the watershed. It's either in the ground or in the tree or. Or it could be evaporated. Right. Right. Uh, and the second question is, if they stopped delivering water tomorrow, how many? days or how many days would the system support what is the, de the, the demand? Well, do you want to answer that? Um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't know where we are exactly today, but um, our general plan was to be, because we have an emergency storage project, was to be able to supply the region um, for six months if our supplies are disconnected. Yeah. I would say our supplies are a little, um, they're a little lower than that right now. For example, we just finished uh, constructing the, expanding the San Vicente Reservoir to increase the storage, but we haven't filled it up yet. Right. So, um, <clears throat> but I can't answer where we are exactly in, today. In, in the plan, she's correct, in the plan there's six months. It changes whether the reservoirs are full or not. But the whole plan is to have six months locally. So say there's a big earthquake that ruptures the imported water pipeline. We have six months uh, in emergency storage. And we might have an earthquake, right? We, we have do. an earthquake we territory. Might. Well, you're, hold, hold your question for a second, Ray. If you're on screens one through six, we just did this last time. If you'd count to 12, so number one should end up on 13, number two on 14. So those are his last six slides, so one through six. If you're at that slides, add 12, so we should see 13, 14, 15 around. We will leave up 11 and 12, so don't change those. All right, Gray, your, Gray, your question. Uh, Luis, you touched uh, briefly on building codes, new codes, or you know, as the crisis worsens. Is there, um, in new construction, are there anything in the codes that it would require, the, like the purple pipes for recycling water, or the new smart meters like San Francisco uses, or? Mm -hmm. Um, right. Uh, and in fact, I think there was a bill introduced in the state to legislature to um, require uh, submeters, like in condos and apartments, so that the Correct. individual 
uh, renter would be uh, know how much water he's using or she using? Correct. Good question. San Diego has a local ordinance for submetering that's in effect. So any new construction or major remodel of uh, multifamily requires a submeter. Uh, we are moving into uh, automated uh, meter interface, the smart meters. And I'll talk about that later in one of the other slides that's coming up. So uh, we are also addressing that. Um, the purple pipe. Oh, well, one of the slides that Toby showed, the, 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 the orders from the governor, also says that for new construction, you cannot install uh, and irrigate uh, your landscape unless you use micro spray or drip or water efficient. So that's, our, that's one of the things that's, if you're planning on putting lawn, you can't put it in because the, according to that uh, order, it has to be micro spray or drip. The rules are changing. So yes. let's, uh, you have slides 12 now all the way around to number six here. So I think you're ready to go on your last set. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I'll, I'll Thank you. There's any questions. So somebody asked about enforcement. That's the next slide. Okay. We need to expand our enforcement efforts. We currently allow people to let us know uh, if they observe any water waste um, happening. We need a partnership practically with, our, with the public because we can't be all over the city, we're throughout the city, there's limited staff, but if they tell us where they see water waste, you know, we respond to them. You can do that by phone, email, uh, um, contacting us, and we have a smartphone app, I'll talk about that later too. But uh, we also are increasing our staff. Right now we have about 17 people throughout the city who can enforce the, the restrictions. 17. Is that many? <laughs> okay. Well, that's why I say if we are out there to provide the tickets, I think that would be enough. But if we, to spot water waste, we need the help of the public you know, because we can't cover the entire city. It's a big city. But as, as we get the complaints, we respond to them. And what uh, the mayor um, um, said in a press conference about two weeks ago is that whereas before when we started July 1st, our restrictions, uh, we send a letter or talk to them, talk to them about the, re the, uh, the restrictions and let them know what the current restrictions are and give them a chance to do the corrective action. Well, we've been doing that for 10 months. Now it's different. So when we go out there and we spot water waste, we can issue already a notice of violation. You know, we want to, we mean business. We, if you are if we have evidence that you are wasting water and you are uh, breaking, uh, not abiding by the restrictions, notice a violation is pretty much a warning. The next step is a citation that carries a fine. So we, you know, the mayor wants to go that direction and we're going that direction. The reason we have 17 is actually we now are working with Stormwater. Stormwater has their own code enforcement people and now since they are interested in avoiding runoff, they help us with, in terms of water waste as it pertains to uh, irrigation, and they can also issue citation. And then because of this new uh, uh, order from the state, uh, we are putting in a late request uh, into our budget for fiscal year 16, which starts July. We're putting in a late request for five more people to make that 22. You know? So we wanna make sure that we cover, we, they see us uh, actively enforcing it so that people know you know, when we uh, say that we are going to enforce it, they, they see that we, the efforts are there. So administrative citation can start $100, two, then $250, $500, $750, $1,000. Uh, yeah, so um, it could end up being sizable uh, if you continue to ignore it. Um, we increased our funding for turf replacement. As we ask people to conserve or do more to conserve, sometimes they need help. They said, I already do all the things that you asked me to. Well, sometimes the next step, it takes a little bit more capital, taking out the turf. Uh, so uh, last year we plugged about, last year, uh, as in September last year, put in a million dollars uh, for grass replacement. We normally would get, I don't know, about 30 applications a year. Last year we got 30 applications in one weekend. And so what happened was the million dollars was uh, pretty much committed in eight weeks. And that was, that was kind of hard, but it's, it's actually very good. And people are 
taking the step to make the change. And the nice thing about it, it's a permanent change. It's not behavior driven that can change after the stimulus has changed. This is now going to be permanent because it's, it changed their landscape. So we said, that's good. We need to look for more, more money. And so uh, earlier, uh, a few months ago, we found some. And we said, we'll restart the program. We restarted the program uh, Wednesday last week. We had three quarters of a million dollars that we were able to find. Stormwater gave us some additional money because you know, it helps them uh, meet their BMPs. And all that money was committed in uh, a week. Wow. So. Yeah, there's a run on it. <laughs> There's a lot of interest, and it's good. And people, San Diego's are stepping up. That that uh, last batch uh, committed to the removal of over 500,000 square feet of turf. That's good, and we're hoping that we can add more money into next fiscal year so that we can uh, service more customers. Um, we are, of course, abiding by the governor's request or mandate to uh, not irrigate uh, uh, grasses and street medians. And we're reviewing our use of water in parks to see where we can cut. I mean, if it's an essential part of the park, more visited versus less visited park, maybe we do it that way so that we can find areas where we can uh, save even more. Uh, we plan to intensify our outreach efforts we have that waste no water campaign that City of San Diego has. I don't know if you are familiar with it. We're active in social media, Facebook, uh, and uh, we uh, we use that a lot. Um, if if you go to our Facebook page, we have what we call uh, uh, maker mark videos. Every Wednesday, we get people from the community to get a video, thirty second video, to tell us how they conserve water. So we've gone through the uh, universities, uh, representatives from the local universities, some athletes, some known people uh, in San Diego, telling us how they conserve water, and San Diego's Make Your Mark conserve water. And that's really getting very popular. We also partner with our large uh, users um, and industry leaders to find out ways that we can uh, conserve water. We don't necessarily want to stifle the economy. We want to get their ideas on how they can conserve water within their premises. And of course, coordinating with the San Diego County Water Authority on messaging, because we want, don't want to be, you know, uh, we don't want to send mixed messages. So moving over here, uh, wait a minute, uh, this is different. Okay, so we have the restrictions in place, but what you'll notice in the next few weeks is we're gonna ask people to do more. Is that, okay, three days a week watering is the requirement, but can you do two? You know, can, if you can do two, well and good. Showering, can you do three minutes? We have an app. This is our app that we develop in, in house. And you can download it iPhone, Android based phones. You know, you, it's free. And it's a neat little tool. As you walk your dog, you're ta you go in for a jog, you take your bike, go around town, you see water everywhere, wasted water. Okay? You just bring out your phone, you know, sign in, take a picture. The, it automatically loads the address of where that picture is taken, so we know exactly where it is. Okay, you can select what you what you notice, whether it's runoff or broken sprinkler head, whatever it is. You can note that, and then when you hit send, it sends it over to us. We automatically get it. We assign it within the next day. We assign it to a, a, a field personnel to investigate. Um, so we, the nice thing about that is if you log in. You can, you can use it as a guest, but if you log in, maybe using your Facebook uh, login, you can also check on the status of your complaint. So if you complain about something last week, you, this week you want to check and see, well, what's happened? Yeah, it will say right there what we did. And if it, if it led to a notice of violation, if it led to a citation, you'll see it there. Now, we also have a button for what are the current restrictions in place so people, if you want to know what the current restrictions are, there programs that we have the rebate the status of the rebate program right now there's none so we would change that and when we do, when we when you click on that it's going to say currently out of funds check with us in july uh, but the reason i put that in is that we're, we want to put another button there to look to create a shower timer 
You know, if you are going to shower, you want to challenge yourself. Uh, I can do a three-minute shower, so you use that as a timer. Instead of getting one of those dials that you put in your shower tub, you can use your iPhone or your smartphone. And then, if you do meet it, hey, share it. Share it on, on social media. But no pictures, please. No pic <laughs> That's right. Maybe we should disable the camera <laughs> capability. But we're trying, we're trying different ways. I know a lot of people use their phones for so many different ways now. Why not go to what they use? and put the message out there for them. So that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> this is the, the new version of the that egg timer. And so you know, a lot of the other messaging would talk about collecting your warm up water. Uh, when you shower, you turn on your shower in the morning, there's a lot of cold water collecting that. We'll, we'll include that in the message, other things that people can do. I know a lot of people have already done these things, but for some people, they may not have considered that, so it, we'll mention that. I talked about the service programs. They're available, and they're free of charge for residential and commercial customers. And I talked about the Pure Water program. We want to accel the, the state to accelerate the, 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 the development of the regulatory framework for Pure Water so that we can make use of Pure Water sooner. Uh, the, the smart meters. Somebody asked about smart meters. Um, there's a hefty price tag to change all the, the meters in San Diego, but we're trying to make a case. Why not let a why let a good crisis go to waste, right? So we're making a case to try and see if we can accelerate that and put more smart meters. Why? Because if you are a residential customer and you get a bill from us every two months about how you're using, how are you going to manage your consumption? It makes sense if you can get more, uh, in this case, real-time information on how you use your water. Then that way, we're again giving you a tool to better manage your water and conserve water. Oops, sorry, Mike's disappearing. So um, we're trying to see if we can get this accelerated and be, it become a, uh, 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 another tool for San Diegans. And the nice thing about it is if it, if it sends a signal like every 15 seconds, and if you notice that you have a consumption in your house that goes 24 hours, even at night, there's a little bit of consumption there, well, guess what? You have a leak. And then that's one way to... Uh, and then we, have, we were developing a web portal so that people can access their consumption, you know, Go online to check and see where your consumption is. But we know that not everybody wants to go online and check, you know, how well they're doing every day. So we're also setting up alerts so that you can predetermine what alert you want. If you have a constant usage, you want to be alerted of that, you can check that box. And if there's a constant usage showing on your smart meter, that will alert it. If you want to set your alert saying, if it goes over this much per day in terms of consumption, let me know. And so it will alert you. You can choose email. You can choose uh, um, text messaging. All that is in the works. It's being developed. Uh, it's not currently in place. But these are, somebody asked about in two years. What will we have in two years? I'm hoping this will be available in two years and helping customers already manage their consumption. Maybe you can have it text your teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> like your showers, you know. You can, you can tell who has teenagers here. Uh, so Toby talked about this. The important date uh, is this one. This is when they make the decision. And we're hoping that the, in, pro, the input that we've provided and a lot of uh, agencies have provided can help them create uh, a system of rating and, and, and uh, reductions that's, that works uh, for most. And that concludes my slides. Very good. So we have 10 minutes. Let's make the most of it. We'll, we'll thank him in just a minute. Now, it's Luis Henedoso. Yes. It? Okay, good. I'll get Perfect. it right this time. So 10 minutes, make your questions tight so we can get through most of these, and let's get to people who haven't asked them first. Tight question. Hi, I'm Shirley. Um, Hi, Shirley. Uh, you know, the energy sector has a very rich ecosystem of um, innovation incentives. There's tons of government grants, SBIR, SDTR. Um, incubators, scholarships, just all kinds of incentives for energy innovation. Why isn't this happening for the water sector when it's 
such a huge problem. I know. We're always like 10 years behind the energy sector. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we can't speed it up a little bit. I know that we work with, the, uh, with San Diego Gas and Electric, which is our version of PG&E. Uh, we work with them on some of the programs. And one of the things that we just got a grant for is a pilot program for pressure regulators in homes. You know, you may have put your ultra low flush toilet, you may have put the shower head that's really good, good and the bathroom sink aerators, but if your pressure is higher than what it should be, well, then you're, you're using more water in those fixtures and likely you could have leaks. When we do a residential survey, we measure the water pressure in the homes that we go and do a survey. And uh, a lot of them, I don't have the percentage right, a lot of them have pressure that's greater than 80 PSI. A lot of those fixtures that you see that's 2.5 gallons per minute, 1.3 gallons per flush are rated at 80 PSI. But if you're using 100 PSI, then that 1.6 gallon per flush uh, toilet is actually using more. And so we partnered with SDG&E because there is hot water savings. The reason that you know, they're interested, there's hot water savings in there because so then there's this case of energy. We partnered with that to try and make that into a real program. Brody. Yeah, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your pure water program. Yes. What that exactly that is and how that's going to work for So city. pure water program is trying to convert the uh, wastewater. Uh, right now what we do is we treat it. Gray water, black water? Black water. You know, so municipal black water it goes into a, a, a treatment system, a, a water recycling system. And then it's distributed to the purple pipes. Uh, it's used for irrigation, used for cooling towers, uh, dust suppression. Okay. But water usage there is seasonal because, you know, then w during the winter months or when it's raining, there's not a whole lot of, gray wa of uh, recycled water use. So pure water, now uh, we want to take that water, treat it to a higher standard, and put it back into the reservoir. So pumping it from the city up into the reservoir? Correct. Correct. So we will just build one pipe from that reclamation plant to the reservoir as opposed to expanding the purple pipe system. Uh, and it will give us a constant uh, demand even during the winter months for that kind of water. And then it makes us also kind of like self-sufficient because it's local water, it's not imported water. Um, and it reduces the flow of wastewater in Point Loma. Originally, the, the, the moniker that was given that it kind of helped uh, the, create the... the the flavor for it, for lack of a better term, was uh, toilet to tap, but uh, there is science behind it. And now in that science, it's interesting because surveys that have been conducted, now people understand what it is and they think that it's a great thing. And so the toilet to tap is really more, you know, the past. It was. <laughs> Here's the, the city of San Diego graphic on the water purification process for pure water. Uh, I do know it goes through six steps of yeah. reverse osmosis, uh, UV, right uh, um, you helped me out with all the processes. UV, microfiltration, uh, uh, reverse osmosis. And it's cleaner than what's coming out of your tap. It, it, it is, it is. So, but, so what happens here is that then it will go to yet another uh, process. If it's um, indirect potable reuse, it then goes to a reservoir or if it's direct potable reuse, if it's really clean, it goes into a treated water pipeline to augment uh, treated water. Could you describe those two again, indirect and direct, so the distinction is made? Indirect meaning to say it would go to a reservoir for further treatment, like it would raw water. Direct uh, potable reuse, it, it is injected into a treated water system that's ready for distribution to the consumers. Yeah, you can also, one other thing they're calling direct <coughs> is you can put it in a raw water pipeline and then take it down to your surface water treatment plant. So that's kind of something in between um, going directly to your treated water pipe. Yeah. You can put it in your raw water system um, and not necessarily go to the reservoir. Thank you. Um, how much water is lost in the distribution system in a day or yeah. Whatever. However you want. Leak, leak. Yeah. How much is leaking, and is there a program to cure the leaks? There's the, there's a best management practice. The city of San Diego, along with a lot of member agencies, 
uh, signed a memorandum of understanding to implement best management practices. And one of the best management practices is, is uh, limiting water loss from leaks. And so uh, that is something that we report on, on, every, on a yearly basis. And there's kind of like a complicated formula for real losses and, and um, apparent losses. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all based on uh, American Water Works standards. But the short story of that is San Diego's loss uh, is right about 5 6%. Uh, industry standard is about 10 So, But can we bring it down to 4 about three, yes. That's one of the things that when we ask for additional staff, I ask for staff for me to have field personnel to go out and enforce. Our operations people added, ask for additional staff so that we can respond quicker to water main breaks, to fire hydrant knockouts, so that we minimize that water. So we show the customers that we're also doing our part uh, uh, in terms of reducing that water loss. Yes? Oh. Uh, the, de the desalination plant in Carlsbad, is that something that was contracted by San Diego County, or is that a bunch of private investors building something and saying, buy it from us, or, or what's okay. the story behind that? So um, the San Diego County Water Authority um, contracted, which is our agency, the wholesale agency, um, we contracted with a private developer who um, is building the plant, and then we have basically what's a take or pay agreement. So we will purchase, and we have agreement on how much that water is going to cost and how they determine that price. So we will buy that water and put it in our wholesale system for delivery to our member agencies. We also have a couple of the, the member agencies had an opportunity to sign on for some of that water that's, that belongs to their agency. So we did have a couple of member agencies who have agreed to take a certain amount and then they're guaranteed with that supply. Is there any long-term plans like for a second one? Or? So what we're doing is um, we are studying the possibility of a, a, a desalination plant at Camp Pendleton, and so we've been we've been doing all the feasibility studies on that, and we're going to be doing pilot study. So, as as a as the region's wholesaler, um, we have a mix of supplies between the Water Authority and our member agencies. So, if if the member agencies step up and provide adequate supply, then we don't need to bring in more water supply. So what we're looking at is the city's got their pure water. Our other member agencies are also looking at potable reuse. So if, and, and what our demand's going to be in the future. So if they provide adequate supply um, through those supplies, then we wouldn't have a need to build desalination. But if there's not, then we have that as a, you know, kind of in the planning stages that we could go do that. Christina, we had desal up here on Carlsbad. Oh, you oh. a good one. Wow. So here's, here's yeah, there it is. It's going to be completed in a few months, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually pretty impressive to see the um, plant design was modeled off um, some of the desalination plants that were built in Israel. So they're pretty proven technology, and then they, they're taking it to the next um, level of the most current technology. So um, it will be coming on later, uh, later this year. And where was desal invented? In San, San Diego. Diego. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> I'm just going to say San Diego. San but. Diego took us, I don't know, I, I two decades to get it back here actually to be oh, okay. built. Interesting. Yeah. Dan? A couple of very short questions. One is, you, have you done any uh, parametric studies against uh, uh, additional desal versus direct potable reuse? So when, when we look at, um, like, we look, we've looked at the cost of these different supplies, and they actually all come in really close in cost. So desalination and potable reuse um, come in pretty close in cost. The advantage on the um, potable reuse is you also get a sewage benefit, a sewage treatment benefit. Right. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, when you had stated that we had six months of emergency use, everybody went, oh, you know, 
And what is the plan to expand that? Because to me, that just seems, if you get that kind of reaction, that's pretty alarming. Yeah, so that, when we did the emergency um, storage project where we invested in local um, storage and local supplies, um, that was based on the time, if you're, it's based on pretty much an earthquake response. So if your pipes are severed coming into the county, um, how long can you last before you get those pipelines back in place? And that was the time estimated to be able to do repairs to be able to bring supply into the region. And so the more we develop local supply, like desalination mm -hmm. or the sure. um, pure water, then the more reliability we're going to have locally. Yeah. Are there any figures on how much water is being used for electricity generation? And is that part of the conservation efforts in the future to use renewable electricity generation? Uh, I'm sure there are numbers. Uh, I know that our water production people have um, um, solar panels in our, our and our treatment treatment plants, um, and, and there's also cogeneration facilities that we have in our facilities, whether it's water, wastewater, wastewater, and because of the gas that comes out, the methane gas. So, uh, some of our facilities can go on island mode, as in off the grid if needed. So uh, definitely looking into that. I just don't have numbers with me today. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of answer in kind of a more global picture on where uh, the inner energy sector is. So, you know, historically we've been relying on these big um, power plants that sit by the ocean in the San Diego region. And then we have the ones through cooling and we had uh, San Onofre. So all of that was uh, cooled by ocean water. And so um, now we're seeing this big, there's a huge transformation in the energy market because we have all the solar fields that are going in out in the desert. You got your Sunrise Power Link and the governor wants to go to 50% renewable. And so those are not um, uh, water, water intensive, the, uh, the solar project. So it, it's a big shift. And then if you have, uh, you're, you're seeing some of these peaker ga uh, gas powered plants. A lot of them can be air cooled, and um, we have one up in SDG and he has one up in Escondido that's um, completely on recycled water for cooling. Um, yeah, uh, back to this desal plant um, up in Carlsbad. Uh, I overheard, you know, a conversation recently where someone was saying, "Oh, it's not perfected yet," and and uh, you know, what's your opinion on the efficiency and you know are, are we getting it's the first plant here but is it going to be perfected over time and how much time would that well, be? Well I, I would say it's pretty proven it's proven technology and so that's why I kind of mentioned we basically they have these big plants over in Israel and they kind of took what they're doing there picked up and put it here and I think you're gonna see um, the technology only getting better because they're looking at different types of membrane technologies that take um, less energy. So you could see, it, you could actually see that technology be a revolution in that yeah. and how it may change in the future. And so, be correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's already being uh, replicated in is it Newport Beach? That they're putting another diesel plant? Well, they were looking at Huntington, Huntington Beach, Beach, but I don't, I don't know the status of the other diesel plants. You know, we've hit our time at 8 o'clock, and I really do want to, I, I, I promise these, these ex experts I would get, in, get them out here at, at 8 o'clock, mm -hmm. and I, I just know we have graduate level learning that goes on here. Would you please help me welcome, or thank Luis oh. and Toby for, for their thank work you. Here. Really terrific having you both. Uh, just a, a quick commercial on what we're doing next week. We have uh, Jacques Shirazi. Uh, who is our yeah. clean tech leader yeah. here at the city of San Diego. Uh, I have it up here. It's not a full-fledged uh, presentation yet, but there is a, he, he's, he's passionately committed to this biomimicry issue. It's like, how do we look at nature and use nature's knowledge to create new technologies and new ways uh, for sourcing water, for sourcing energy, uh, for doing things more efficiently. So nature has had 
a billion years to actually you know, perfect its technology. So why not look at nature to see how we can make better design in our system? So there is a challenge, a $100,000 challenge by the National Bio Biomimicry Institute to, um, to actually fund a project that would be progressive in that nature. So he's going to be talking about that here next Wednesday. If you'd like to come here, Jacques, talk about that. And speaking of uh, what the, the utility is doing, we just had uh, today booked uh, a man named Rob Anderson. So Rob, I'm just so thrilled that he's going to come here next month, a month from now, for our green scene. Rob is the system planner for the city of San Diego, or excuse me, for SDG&E's utility. So here's a guy, his responsibility is to look forward five and 10 years and 20 years out and figure out what power plants do we need? How do we actually allocate our resources, funding resources, whether it be for solar, for wind, for gas power plants? How do we keep the lights on 24-7 in a, in a new economy that's putting solar on the rooftop at gangbuster speed? We have more solar than any other, uh, any other city than one in the country. We are second in the country in solar installations. So that's a hard thing for utilities to manage. So Rob will be here for a month from now. You can always look at our whole schedule to be here. Again, I invite you to join us as a member if you want to use this place as one of your own training facilities or for your own event or fundraiser. This is also available for that. With that, I thank you all for being here. Great to have you come. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and go out and tell your friends to save water. There's yes. a great, <laughs> great number of handouts that Toby brought. Please take these home, share them with your kids, share them with your school. This is what we need to do right now. It's an emergency. Or a crisis, anyway. I don't think it's an emergency. It's a crisis. <laughs> Depends. What level so are we at? Yeah. Emergency. We're an emergency. Okay. Yes. We're an yes. emergency. <laughs> Not crisis. Thank you. Really thank you very fun. much. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> you both are great. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Isn't that nice? Yeah, I like it. I like it. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's there. You can leave and it you can go back to 